Okay, so we really received a really interesting question uh, from an RNT uh, Terry Spires uh, a couple of weeks ago where he said to me he really enjoys the, the team discussions and we were talking about supplements uh, and there's a recent supplement episode that we released and he said, I'd love to know, um, based on some of the earlier episodes you did, what you've changed your mind on. And I thought it was a really interesting uh, question that I thought I'd propose to you guys, bring you guys onto the, the pod and uh, sort of see what see what we've changed our minds on over the years uh, when it comes to achieving world-class transformations. So, Ed, let's kick it off. What's uh, what's one of the many things you may have changed your mind on? Well, the first thing that came to my mind was around buffering. So the the concept basically of shifting calories around in a, in a day or in a week, but to try and create room for, for higher calorie meals. So whether that's you're going out for a meal of work or you've got a date or whatever it is, social occasion, so that meal is likely going to be higher in calories than what you'd normally having for, say, a dinner. So I think three years ago, um, and I think this makes a lot of sense on paper, I'd often recommend people reducing calories around that. So maybe within that day, if that wasn't feasible because the, the increase in calories was going to be so big, maybe across the day before and day after as well to try and balance it out. Also potentially would manipulate activity as well to try and um, kind of account for that energy balance change. Um, and that's something I've really done like a 180 on over the last three years for sure. Um, as I said, I think it makes a lot of sense on paper in terms of we know like energy in, energy out, trying to balance that. And so if we can try and keep that same deficit across the week on paper, yeah, it makes sense. We can keep that rate of progress going in a fat loss phase. Um, and you can almost have your cake and eat it from a going out and socializing, but still making progress perspective. I think what we were seeing, um, or at least what I was seeing anyway, was that it was often then having a knock-on effect. So in terms of being really hungry going into the event, and so whereas that that meal may have been like slightly more calories than normal, suddenly it was turning into potentially a binge. But even if it wasn't like necessarily like categorized a binge, it was still way more calories than was really needed. It also meant that if you were also compensating the following day, that that would then potentially lead to slip ups further down the line because the next day you're then hungrier and again you know there's there's potentially un more unplanned higher calorie meals going in and so when you actually looked at it in reality across the week you were kind of just just setting you setting the members up for for failure really um and then the other aspect of that really was that no one was ever really going into meals with a strategy that they could use long term but you know the balancing calories and things i think makes sense on paper for, for a very short transformation but if we want people to be living a healthy lifestyle long term, maintaining their results, a big part of that is knowing how to socialize, how to go out without having to do this, this really restrictive approach. Um, because, you know, yeah, you can get through a short term diet implementing buffering, but that's not something you want to be doing long term, especially if you've got regular meals out with business, whatever it is, what not eating for half the day, just so you can then have your, your meal on the Saturday night with your, your partner or whatever it is, is not a long term strategy. Um, so yeah, for those two reasons, as primarily um, the recommendations I'd normally give now is to, to eat as normal and then to swap your highest calorie meal that day for the meal you're going to have out. So I think that's it's good in, in a few ways in that you're not approaching the meal so hungry because you're having your, your normal meals up to that point. Also means that there's not pressure, but there's you really need to make sure that you're making a good a good choice when you're out because if you then go and have go crazy overboard when you're out and your calories will be a lot higher for the day. And so I think it helps people actually make better choices from not going in so hungry, but also knowing there isn't this room, that this buffer, so they can go crazy, which helps with making choices in the short term, but then also helps them learn to make good choices in the long term as well. And I think on paper, you could say, well, calories are probably going to be higher if all things go well than the buffering approach. And so fat loss may be slightly slower. But for me, that trade-off of slightly slower fat loss is so worth it when you actually put it into reality. Um, and as I said, when you actually put what's on paper into reality, the buffering wasn't balancing energy balance. It was poor, poor return on, on a lot of effort, really. Yeah, 100%. Might I drop there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the, one thing I wouldn't, the one thing I wouldn't agree with, Ed, on that is that it leads to better fat loss in the short term. I've never seen it do it. Oh, I, I, I just think, on paper, just on paper, yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly right. I, I think what it does is just, yeah, it cultivates this negative relationship with food, which, as you said, we don't want this behavior to go in the long term. You know, uh, back in the day, we had people still in investment phase 
wanting that to be like a long-term strategy to be like, I just want to reduce my calories throughout the week. So I can just, I want to buffer my calories throughout the week. So I can over, I can, I can just eat whatever I want on the weekend. Right. That's the perfect lifestyle balance. And then, you know, on paper that may work. Right. But in practice, we need to look at what, what is that actually doing? Firstly, if that if that's the sort of approach that you want, that already tells us that you're not prioritizing your performance and well-being throughout the week. You're willing to cut back on all your calories throughout the week just so you could binge on the weekend. That actually sounds like a bit of an eating disorder. You know what I mean? So that the whole concept of buffering, this whole concept of you know banking calories for an event, not only is it unproductive in the short term, in my opinion, it's also just really, really bad over the long term because you just build this negative connotation with, yeah, nutrition and then also the stuff that you do afterwards oh, i'm going to go do excessive cardio the following day because i ate I over ate so i'm just going to make sure i balance the books by doing more cardio the following day and this this um very what's the right word superficial view of energy balance i think people are like well yeah it's just calories in calories out right that's just as simple as that but there are many factors that go into that and yeah it just simply doesn't solve any problems long-term, and it doesn't teach you how to make the right choice when you are out. One of the big things I think that we push now is teaching our members to, when they go out, that there is always a sensible choice that they can make. And if you're if you're going into this social event, yeah, as Ed said earlier, starving, um, having not eaten anything for a while, or even, yeah, reduced your calories even further throughout the week to, to prepare for this meal, 10 times out of 10, you are going to overconsume at that meal way more than you would have if you just approached the meal normally. So I think this shift away from trying to balance the books for this optimal fat loss um, during the week and, you know, you go out and socialize and do whatever you want and still get your results. It doesn't, it doesn't fix the underlying issue, which is, Hey, you still need to be able to go out and know how to make a sensible choice and manage your portions. That's what this whole game is about, you know? Mm. So yeah, I would, um, I would agree with all the points that Ed mentioned on buffering, but AB, what about yourself? Any thoughts on buffering? Yeah. So if we think about where it came from, I think it came from like the final few weeks of a, of a fat loss phase where, you know, things are, there's no room for error, right? So you may be on really low calories and you have these events that you, you know, you may or may not have to go to. And I think where it came from was like, okay, you're going to a steakhouse. You, the best thing you can do is get a, a 250 grand fillet, for example, but you're still going to have, say, 30 grams of fat coming in that meal. That may or may not be almost all your fat in the day. So what you need to do is pull back on the fat in the day so you have the room for, for the evening. I think that's where the original sort of concept came from. I think it got blown out of context in its use, and then it turned into like a game where every day you were, you were gamifying your calories effectively mm. and, and creating that poor relationship with food in the process, which I think... Where the, where the deeper issue lies. I think where it started from like a use sparingly strategy in the final three weeks of fat loss suddenly became uh, yeah, lifestyle yeah, yeah, just used in a lifestyle solution. And I think I, I talk about it in the book where I say like, you know, when, I, when we did that, when we looked over the book a few weeks ago, years ago, I remember thinking, oh, it's buffering is probably one thing needs to be rewritten that that whole section but if you if we if we look at that section in the book it does talk about it in 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 that context that i just mentioned and then as soon as you get out of fat loss to move away from buffering but again i think it's one of those things that where people see something they they, they take it to the next level and then they think oh this is something i can just use all the time mm -hmm. um and i think that's where it, it sort of that's where i would i would i would change and i think potentially just the the application of it would be different. So even as simple as not putting, not giving a name to it would have probably helped mm. because then it became a thing to use and then uh, mm. apply different levels of, of its use uh, accordingly. So yeah, yeah. that's and where we're wrong. Yeah, exactly. And it's not the, maybe, yeah, maybe it's the, the definition of it or maybe it's the way it's been implemented is just being taken out of proportion. But even in our most recent article on, you know, how to eat out and lose weight, I still propose another way that you could potentially buffer calories without actually mm -hmm. going into the event starving. You know yeah. what I mean? So just make, yeah, yeah. making some like sensible swaps that sort of keep the, the weight of your meals the same, but you just change the calorie density. So yeah. you're still not, you're still going to be quite full when you go into the, into the event. It feels like you just had a normal day of eating. And then you, even, even if you do have this, these, this room for extra calories, you're still going to make a sensible choice because you're not starving. You know, and that, the whole point of that is not to just give yourself permission to overconsume, because I think yeah. that is where people go wrong. It's well, what you mentioned not there. Is, and what mm. you mentioned there is actually like the, the proper sensible buffering strategy. It's like you you increase yeah. the calorie density 
you know, you decrease calorie density, increase the volume yeah, yeah, yeah. through the day, yeah. and then you have quote unquote room in the evening. But I think where he got Correct. extrapolated was it, it became like a all right, let me smash my steps, let me yeah, start myself, myself the whole day, and let me yeah. fast all day long. Uh, and then yeah. you, and then each day you're just sort of yo yo dieting effectively. So Correct. again, it's all in its application, but I think the the, the thing we've probably all wish we'd done better then is probably just be very specific in its application um, and know when mm. it's when it's when it should and shouldn't be used and then give clear guidelines on how this is not a, a regular strategy mm. because probably what was happening yep. is we were talking about it and then when it was happening we were quite blase with oh they've uh, you've buffered okay cool that's cool just you know use that next time it worked work well this time got the fat mm. off it kept the fat off so keep to keep doing it it's obviously part of your lifestyle but it's actually not yeah. Mm-hmm. On the topic of process phase, uh, one of the things that I thought of um, <clears throat> for, for this particular part of the journey is uh, excess activity. So I used to be of the mind of um, lots of stims, lots of cardio, lots of lots of steps. Probably come from my you know, my old bodybuilding days, and I, it's something I probably just applied towards the general population and and i've learned since that even for my bodyboarding it doesn't need to be done uh where you know you go 20 000 steps a day hour of cardio a day stimmed up to the gills on a gram of caffeine not that we're giving a gram of caffeine to to members but I, this is what i was doing and then some variation of that was was being passed on to to members and i think i've learned mainly from my 2022 diet that I actually don't need to do an hour of cardio a day. Don't need to do 20,000 steps a day. As long as my nutrition's on point, the highest I went to last year uh, was three days a week of 30 minutes cardio. And uh, I think I did 14, 15 K steps, but that was more for my own like mental sake where I think I was telling you guys, yeah, I'm just going to do a few more just, just to like tick that box in my head. Cause, but for the most part, it was about 10 to 12 K. And I think I learned from that, that, and also without any uh, stimulants or, um, things outside of coffee. And I learned um, from that, that all along, I didn't actually need to do the aggressive pushes I was doing. And then I think we were talking about it recently. I think it might be with you, Ivan, but I was saying, I think we were saying, well, why, why do you think you did that? And I think one of the reasons why I pushed people quite hard back in the day was almost as a safety mechanism because in case they were going to mess up. So I was like, well, they're probably going to underreport what they're doing. They're probably not going to be as adherent as I think they are. So let me just push them yeah. harder on paper and, and have yeah. a safety gap there. Whether or not that was the yeah. right strategy, I'm not sure because the extra activity may have made them more hungry. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. So that, that that push for more activity, more activity, more activity could have easily driven hunger up way more. You know yeah. what I mean? And could have got them to not adhere to the diet. And, you know, instead, yeah, I understand that. I understand that perception. But I think now, I think these days we're, um, we do, tr- we communicate a lot, a lot more with our members and, you know, get more feedback and see, you know, how they're responding, how they're feeling, and then make adjustments based on that. And not just assume they're going to be, you know, under reporting or whatever. Like, and we, just, we all know that's a problem. Um, and just on that, like that, know. that sort of 20K steps, our cardio, like, just not to say that that can't be done. It's like if someone's behind and they need, they've got to shoot in two, three weeks and they have to get as much fat loss as, as possible, then yeah, sure, you're going to have to, you might have to do that. But I think what I was doing at the, back then was just like, it was just part of the routine. Like, you know, you, yeah. you, you just I would even say increase yeah, the height. Exactly. But I would even say they don't need to, they just need to manage their nutrition. But you know what I mean? Like, I think, I think what, where that 15 K 20 K steps and hour of cardio comes in is more from like a personal development perspective. I think there is something to that where it's like, yeah, I yeah. can, I can push hard when I need to. I think that can be very valuable in another way, but from a purely fat loss perspective, there is plenty you can do with diet alone, enough weight training, prioritizing recovery. I think that was probably something that we neglected a lot back in the day was prioritizing sleep and stress management because if you get those things nailed down in a dieting phase, it's going to make the whole process that much easier, right? That's probably another thing we've changed our minds on. Well, I have anyway. Yeah, I mean, the other thing to remember is like five years ago, we were probably like mid to late 20s. Now we're like mid to <laughs> early to mid 30s. Two of us got kids. <laughs> it's like you think about, you definitely do think about training and, and recovery and stress management a lot differently. Correct. Yeah, for sure. What about what yeah. are you guys' inputs on like sort of activity and steps? Have you guys had that same sort of realization? Were you as big as Yeah, I think I think for me, I've never I've definitely moved in that direction. I think I was definitely probably pushed cardio more. I always favored cardio over steps. I think just from 
maybe just from myself, just a bit aware of like the time management perspective of it. It's not to say I haven't pushed people to 20k steps in the past, but by any means. Um, no, I agree. I think there is definitely a time and a place where, where things are gonna have to have to gonna get get hard. Um, cardio will be high, steps will be high. If there is a deadline and you know it's it's getting tight, then you know, things will have to get pushed hard. But as a general rule, yeah, my general approach would be um would probably be less cardio and steps than, than I was doing previously. I think um <clears throat> Focusing more on just fixing the adherence at, at source with nutrition. It's definitely been something that's been behind that. Um, but I also think as as you touched on there, Akash around like potentially the the extra activity was then increasing hunger. I think another aspect of it is just the time demands that the increased activity, I think more than hunger, the biggest thing that most of our uh, our members will struggle with is like time management side of things and just yeah. organize everything because they've, they've just got so many demands in their life with family and work and everything. And extra steps, extra cardio is is kind of hammering that time demand as well. And then what does a lot of people do when they're stressed or struggling with time management? Well, they either Every. snack for comfort or they prioritize getting an extra walk in over meal prep and then nutrition slips for the next couple of days. So I think by us being better at, um, at letting everyone know what the, the biggest rocks are. So if you're in a fat loss phase, you need a miss. Ideally, smash everything. If it becomes an either or, nail your nutrition. If that means missing a walk in order to do that, that's okay. We'd rather you did that. Um, so I think us us um, communicating what's the most important aspects of the journey as well, I think has, has helped with that. Um, as well as, yeah, us probably just becoming better at um, managing our, or helping our clients to manage their time as well. Even like five years ago, I'd say it was very much like training, nutrition, cardio, uh, steps these are the things you need to do now mm-hmm. it's like how do we make adherence 100 percent? and mm-hmm. and try to and, and those answers are always never in oh yeah maybe try broccoli instead of uh kale mm-hmm. or you know what, whatever that the, you're trying to optimize the, the foods or trying to optimize the the training plan where it's just really optimizing lifestyle stress management adherence habits behaviors what you do in certain scenarios when you're stressed usually when you're stressed tired and exhausted and bored i think that's been linked though of even what the the job role was with an rmt yeah i think when i came on it was the job role was a train online trainer and then we were online trainers we were talking about training and diet advice and just keeping people active in general that then evolved into transformation coach which you know maybe it's just like it's only a name but we're not just trainers anymore and, and the coaches on the team we are looking at things beyond just what they're doing in the gym and what they put in their mouth not that we've become life coaches but we're taking a lot more into account the recovery side of things the, the more the mentality side of things actually putting all of the pieces of the jigsaw together to make sure it actually is it, it works for their lifestyle etc that's why when people when pts uh approach approach and say hey is there job openings uh, it's not it, it's not like i'm like no, they're not. It's more like, yeah, you're going to have to go through the whole process because I know that just being a PT on the gym floor doesn't equate to being able to do what we do here because, yes, it will help mm-hmm. you to uh, help you do a lot of things, but there's a big psychological component that I think has probably been, I'd say, the biggest shift in the last five years is just how much we've realized psychology is is the key to this. It's everything. It's literally everything. Um, I think we were saying earlier, I used to, oh, this, this probably ties in but i used to think yeah the more our members know the more i can educate them on hey did you know protein does this hey did you know fats do this <laughs> like the the better the better choices they would make when they're out right but then when you think about it everyone knows what to do everyone 90 percent of people that come to us they know exactly what to do right yet they still haven't got the results that, they, that they're after so there is a missing link there everyone knows what to do they don't know how to implement the right decision at the right time you know, how do you manage your emotions after a long day? How do you manage yourself when you've had a bad night's sleep, which can happen time to time? You know, these are the things that really matter over the long term. You know, um, you know, I've always said, you know, what you do in private is what you wear in public. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, I think this holds so true when it comes to body composition and nutrition, especially, you know, so if we can cultivate better ways for people to manage stress, um, manage their emotions, I think that that for me has probably been the biggest turnaround with regards to what how I how I would like to help the people that we work with the most. It's that side of things. The X's and O's about protein, calories, and meal timing, those are all nice to have. But this like 
how you handle your emotions, how you handle your stress, how you structure your days, et cetera. All these things are like the bread and butter of results. But for me, it used to be the other way around. Yeah. I think the, the exhaustion thing is interesting. Like you know, having a newborn, I you probably attest to this as well. It's like you, you, some nights are just not going to be good. And then next day, you just have this like lingering sensation of just, you just know you're sleep deprived. And there's always that temptation of like, oh, yeah, maybe I should just get a takeaway today. And one of the things I said to Chani, um before CRI was like let's just make sure the first month we don't we don't do any of these takeaways we don't just get takeaways because it's so easy right you know when you're short on time you're exhausted it's like oh yeah we just order sort of pizza thing because once you do that once then you know it's gonna happen again then again then again mm -hmm. and your whole diet and then the next thing you know you've got a dad bod and you're stuck <laughs> in that scenario again and but it's, it's been interesting to see that how aware you have to be of your choices and what you're you're feeling in that moment and how things 100%. like meal prep um some sort of non-negotiables and having rules make such a difference in in staying fit and healthy when you are tired, stressed, bored, whatever the different things are. It's always a good sign of your three S's. You know, how how strong they are is how present they are in stressful times, you know? So always a good um litmus test for your three S's, in my opinion. That's what I'm getting. That's why I'm trying to get 10 sessions a weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how hard can I push myself? Um on to, so you mentioned uh, the X's and O's. I think one th one thing that I've um, uh, I I've sort of changed my mind on is protein, uh, protein intake. So I'll say about five years ago, up to about five years ago. Um, well, if I say over the last 10 years, it's gone from like two pounds of body weight per gram. So two grams of body weight per pound. That was that was the first five years. Then I sort of settled into like 1.2 1 to 1.5, especially for men. I'd say in the last five years, I've, I've 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 lowered my thinking around protein from that to you know 0 0.8, but sometimes even lower. I'd say now personally, in the last year, um, when I'm not dieting, like I think I'm probably like 0 0.6, 0 0.7 grams per pound. So I've definitely lowered my thinking around protein and how much is actually required to continue building strength, muscle, keeping it, um, and achieving good body composition. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I, I I don't think I was that extreme. I think I did start going more towards the lower end a few years back, but I, even even more recently, I, yeah, again, I think protein, yeah, it's fantastic. It's definitely the the main nutrient everyone should be prioritizing. Especially the people that we work with, um, it's one of the macronutrients that even, even in general guidelines, even like the RDAs for Australia and even the UK, the protein intake is still like super low. That's, that's one thing that I just, the mo most, of the, I think, most of the dietary guidelines actually are quite good if people follow them. But the one thing they should change, in my opinion, is is the the protein recommendation because yeah, it's still like crazy low for some reason. But I think they are, they are working on rectifying that. But what what sort of came to my attention recently was the whole like satiating effect of protein. I used to always push, yeah, no, protein is the most filling, the most satiating uh, macronutrient, and in and of its own. It probably is in comparison to say carbs and fats and whatnot. But what seems to matter more for satiety is actually your food choices. You know, like a good example would be okay, what's more filling? Uh, a whey protein shake mixed with some water or like 500 grams of like mushrooms and broccoli and stuff like that. You know, what, what's going to fill you up more? What do you reckon? The vegetables. Yeah. Well, the vegetables have far less protein than the protein shake. So why, you know, what's, what's going on here? So it's not just the macronutrient that actually matters for satiation. It's actually the whole food matrix. And yeah, having some protein within that food matrix definitely helps. But to just sort of come out and be like, no, no, no protein is the most satiating because X, Y, Z. Yeah, that that doesn't seem to really hold up. So that's definitely something I've changed my mind on too, because because of that thinking of proteins more satiating, I did want to gravitate towards higher protein intakes for more people. Um, which again can be problematic. You know, not everyone can, not everyone enjoys consuming a higher protein diet. You know what I mean? So having that leeway with, you know, being able to bring that protein down, I think is um has been a huge bonus from a coaching perspective as well. The yeah. satiation thing is actually something that <clears throat> I'd questioned. Obviously, I'm gonna say this in hindsight, make myself so far. Someone I'd questioned <laughs> in my head for quite a bit. Because yeah. the thing that I always wondered was, is it satiating because it's just not as tasty? So like oh, I have like 200 grams of chicken breast. Oh, I don't really want another 100 grams. But let's say you yeah. have a few pieces of bread or like a bowl of pasta. It's like you finish it, you're like, oh, I could still eat more. And then it's like, was that just satiating because it's like you don't want to keep consuming it? In the same way, you know, broccoli, obviously not protein source, but you have a big mm. bowl of broccoli. You don't want to keep eating it. 
bowl of cookies you probably do want to keep eating it does that just come down to like palatability kind of thing it's kind of thing i always thought in my head maybe but maybe but if you had yeah if you put if you had chicken thighs with you know some crumbs on that you know what i mean you could probably take quite a bit of that oh down, yeah right? yeah for sure but i mean that, that's <laughs> what i mean like is that is it just because what most people think of like typical protein sources yeah they're quite something you'd normally yeah. overeat so it's like oh it must be more satiating mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know. yeah 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 chicken breast is super dry as well takes a while to chew down mm, that's a good diet diet hack overcook your chicken yeah, breast you you don't even want to eat. <laughs> yeah <laughs> it actually is a decent dieting hack yeah. so on to so we covered like a lot of the stuff in dieting so we've gone through buffering uh cardio activity um and sort of protein this all covers i'd say up till the moment you're in the shape of your life so your checkpoint once you shift gears into sort of consolidation what are some of the things that you've you've changed your mind on so, so a big one for me is actually just before consolidation is basically when when potentially is the right time to to finish a diet i think on on paper and it's like maybe ideally what people go in is is hitting that that amazing checkpoint condition the the shape of their life um but i think i'm a lot more aware now that potentially sometimes the trade-off of of getting that isn't always worth it for, for everyone or and you know what that what that checkpoint looks like may not be what they could physically achieve or the best checkpoint for them at that time isn't necessarily physically the leanest they could get but is a balance of of how far they can push physically but also mentally as well um i think we it's been discussed on other podcasts um that we've done around like potentially some of the the physical side effects that can come from from really pushing to extreme in terms of body composition but i think a big part that's that's also sometimes missed is just the duration of being in a diet for so long and that's not not completely not but it's not 100 percent related to actually getting leaner and by that i mean when you start a fat loss phase the clock starts how well you adhere to your your plan will determine how much body fat you lose during that time but even if you don't adhere to it you're still semi-focusing on fat loss. You're trying to think about it. Even if you only go to half your gym sessions, even if you don't meal prep half the time or you nail your food Monday to Friday, this is the most common one. You nail it Monday to Friday, you go off the bandwagon at the weekend. So you end up at maintenance across the week so you don't actually make any progress. Physically, you've made no progress, but you've still had a week of, of focusing on diet and building up what's often coined as like this diet fatigue so the fact that you're having to to track all of your meals that you're having to just consciously think about that stuff block out time for things when things don't go so well nutritionally there's probably an, some form of mental frustration that comes into play if you do go off track all weekend by sunday night you're probably feeling some regret you step on the scale on monday even if you're not making any physical progress, it is wearing you down mentally being in, in a fat loss phase. Now, there's definitely ways how you approach fat loss phase will then determine how much that wears you down per week. <clears throat> but after X amount of time, and that time will be different depending on the person and the approach, mentally, you just you probably hit a point at which pushing on further is just going to have more of those negatives are going to come on for every, every ounce of body fat that comes off. And so I think, whereas before... <clears throat> I was aware of it, but I was a lot more focused on what was happening physically. And if there was more body fat to come off, potentially pushing on with more of that diminishing returns in terms of what well, the worst trade-off that was occurring at the end. Whereas now I think I'm a lot more aware of, of seeing that. And if I don't think the the negatives that are going to come from pushing on are worth the positives of, of dropping the extra, extra body fat, I'd be a lot, a lot quicker to pull people out of a fat loss phase, um, which means, yeah, they don't get quite as this is not across the board, but, you know, so people in that case will hit their checkpoint not quite as lean, but they're in a much better place mentally. And how they're able to then consolidate and move on from there is is a lot more successful rather than taking someone to the edge of a cliff to the point they can't even hold on anymore. So then consolidation, they, even with all the, the best plan in the world, they're just going to fall off. If you can take them to the edge of the cliff and not so far, they have to fall off. They can then in consolidation, you know, start. Yeah, there's nothing worse than dieting, dieting but not dieting. Because you don't get the best yeah. of either. you don't get the best of anything. You're dieting purgatory. Yeah, you <laughs> you can't enjoy yourself without the guilt, as you mentioned. And you're always thinking about your diet, but you're not actually making progress. You might fluff it up and say, "But I enjoy it going slow. I uh, I want to take the slow approach. I'm enjoying yeah. it." Etc. No, anyone who says that is just kidding themselves. 
but they're not making any progress really. Yeah. And yeah. the reality is they just want, don't want to get stuck in and get the result. Yeah. I mean, anything to add to that? Um, with regards to what consolidation and whatnot, I think what, what one of the points that Ed brought up earlier was really good with regards to, yeah, knowing when to pull people out, but this doesn't mean that they can never attempt a diet again mm-hmm. in the future as yeah. well. So I, I just wanted to make an example of, you know, one of our members, Nickel, right? So he got in, you know, decent condition when he first came on, which is great. You know, he got in, it was it was really good shape. But then when he took the time to um, consolidate, invest quite a bit. And I think throughout that investment period, he also learned a lot about nutrition. He also learned a lot about himself. He learned uh, a lot in comparison to when he first came on. So then when he went for, I think it would, it would have been his third process phase with me, actually, that is when he ended up, you know, bringing in his ultimate package from mm-hmm. like a leanest conditioning perspective. And like he got into incredible shape. And not only did he get into incredible shape, he actually came out of that in great spirits. You know, he didn't, um, he he gained a couple of kilos post um, transformation checkpoint because he knew that wasn't a realistic body weight to um, stick with. He, you know, there were no episodes of anything. Like he was really onto it. He was really aware of what was going on. He knew what to do coming out of that phase. So he developed them, but he, you know, from my looking back, I think he developed a lot of that maturity maybe during his first couple of diets because he never, he, maybe he like he, he probably didn't go all the way those couple the first few times, but he got a he got a taste of what it's like, and then he knew when he was going to go for his ult, like his I'll say his ultimate cut. I think he was just in a much better position to nail it, you know, and he nailed it unbelievably. There was virtually no slip ups the entire time, completely adherent, even on the way out. He was just like, yeah, cool, whatever. What's the next thing, you know? Yeah. And I think because of that, you know, he had that time to really develop and understand nutrition and get all his basics intact to then really push it, you know? So that's definitely something that I've learned as well. Just because we, just because someone can't do the diet now doesn't mean it can't happen later on, yeah. you know? So long, I think it's a caveat. So long as you're not just sacrificing your standards here to not wanting to go all the exactly. way, I think there's got to be, yeah, yeah, I think this is where a coach can make an objective decision rather than, I can't yeah, just yeah. Think, oh, I'm not ready yet because I heard on the podcast I need three three times to attempt it. It's like, no, mm, no, 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 no. Just, just that, <laughs> that it's always you always want to go for it, but it's it's a decision that I think you need expertise and experience to be able to gorge. I think sure. that what comes to the the kind of people that come to mind with with this is if you're if you're nailing it and you made you really committed to the process and you made it a high priority, this probably isn't going to be something that applies to you. It's more if for, for people who, who dip their toe into fat loss, they're doing the five days on, two days off, they're in for a week, they're out for a week, and it's it's this um, it's good intentions but not really backing up with consistent action. It's those type of people who can can run out of steam before they've actually run out of body fat, if, if we're going to use that kind of analogy. Yeah. Um, and in which one. case, really that, if, if you're going in and out all of the time, by the time we do get the body fat off to the point you have, you've just gone in and out for so long. It's just, it's, it's It's brutal. Whereas if you just spent exactly the same or less time, but just gone all in, the body fat would be gone before you'd run out of steam. And so then you're, you you know, you're in a great position there. But I think also just to touch on what Ivan said with nickel is that just put some timelines into it. He did a really, he really committed to his investment phase. And I think, what I don't want people to think is, all right, so if I pull out of a diet early or before I hit my intended checkpoint, I'll take a week off and then I'll go back in. And that's not what we're saying here. It's not I've got a holiday coming up or it's also my mate Stag. Do so I'll just I'll do I'll pop out the diet and then I'll come back in. This is like the reason you didn't get there initially isn't going to be is going to be something more deep rooted where it's like if it's the weekend thing. Okay, you need to learn how to manage your weekends. Um, you need to learn how to socialize. You need to learn how to time management. Whatever the underlying issue that was was put, holding you back from going all in initially, and this is obviously what we're here to help guide you with. But there needs to be time away from fat loss, which is probably going to be fairly prolonged. Six months, I would say, is an absolute minimum. But as a, a rough guideline, it's probably going to be like a twelve month period away from dieting to then sort the underlying issue to allow you to go all in and not repeat the same thing again. Um, and that's where you know an investment phase. Um, between those periods is what's going to actually set you up for that second diet. It's not, I'll just take a week off so I can come in really motivated again. That's not it. You've got to deal with the underlying issue as to why you're not, um, or why you didn't fully commit and just really go for it that first time. And just like following on uh, the back of consolidation, one thing you said before whilst preparing for this podcast was around um, 
not going too slow with consolidation uh, on the other side. And before you go into it, some context of what I've done wrong is I've when I've when I've hit a checkpoint or gotten really lean, I've tried to hold on to that period too long by being too slow with my with my jumps in both calories but also in, in body weight. And I've tried to play that game again. That's the psychological game that yeah. we, we have to play. It's another diet. It's so another you're, diet. Yeah, you're basically just dieting to stay stay shredded. Um, do you want to, do you guys want to expand on on that? Just uh, what you all said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me the the principle still remained the same of of um yeah for often pulling back on activity post diet and increasing food in, in stages to try and find like a, a maintenance level. I think where I've changed is just how aggressively I try and or quickly get back to that maintenance. Um so I was never doing the whole lane naught and 100 calories a week increase or whatever, but I was definitely on the more cautious side of things. Um, probably also going back to what we said earlier around wanting to create that safety net in case they did overdo it yeah. a little bit. Because we know that post post checkpoint time, hunger is going to be quite high. You haven't got that checkpoint to to keep as that extra motivation. So it can be a challenging time in terms of nutritional adherence. So probably trying to play it safe. But by trying to play it so safe, Again, I was just setting people up for failure, really, in terms of they were still really hungry. <clears throat> they were just in a slightly smaller deficit than before. And so it, was, it wasn't it was setting them up in the best place to help them adhere. And so definitely for from what I've done, implemented myself, um, but also with, with members for a while now, but within that last three-year period, for sure, um, it's just making especially that initial food bump quite a bit, bit larger. I was thinking earlier trying to put a percentage to it. I don't know if this is probably a good idea, but it's probably close to like the 20 to 25% food increase. I don't know if maybe that's not not right, but Sounds about right. it gives people a bit of a ballpark. Basically, my attempt is that first increase to try and get them up to a conservative maintenance prediction. So it's not going to be spot on straight away, but to try and get them as soon as possible. Yeah. Thinking really is that as soon as you hit your checkpoint, you're no longer in a fat loss phase. So we're not, being in a deficit isn't at all the goal anymore. So the sooner we can get you to maintenance, we're actually now in line with what the goal is for this phase. But also the sooner we can start to increase food as much as possible, the easier it is to come out of, of that fat loss phase on track, yeah. basically. So often binges and things like that or overeating will occur due to physical hunger as well as you know emotional stuff. And we can put clients in a better place so they're, they're not still feeling restricted or as as little restriction as possible it's just going to help with what well, i found it to help a lot a lot with adherence um and just getting them out of consolidation i find now that consolidation phases most often are actually relatively short to whereas they were before and when i really think about it it's probably my fault you know that they were taking so long before because we were having to fix so much adherence stuff and yeah i think that also links in often i'd be hesitant to make food increases during that time until they're adhering to what we already had in place yeah. Whereas what we had in place was the reason for them not yeah, struggling yeah, to adhere. Yeah, yeah. And so again, <clears throat> you know, I set them, yeah, yeah. them up for, for failure on there. Whereas now, even if someone is struggling to adhere, instead of saying, all right, we need to really know, sometimes I'm even thinking, all right, well, actually, maybe we'll do another food bump because that might actually be what's going to help you adhere. Now, adherence obviously can come from a lot of different aspects, but that post checkpoint time, just not having enough food to to, for, to expect people to realistically be consistent with it is is definitely a consideration for sure. And what's, what's the, the um what, what's the, the formula, formula that we built into Pro for consolidation success? So the way we we kind of judge if if consolidation has gone well is looking at what we um <clears throat> what we track as a part of the weekly check in So subjective scores that the members are are scoring for themselves, but across I guess kind of lifestyle questions. So looking at things like how has your mood been libido, sleep quality, um, satiety. So looking at like, I guess you could call them like basic health markers. Um, obviously not looking at like blood markers on there, but like basic subjective health markers. Once they're at a four, four out of five plus across the board, then we know, okay, you're, you're in a good place. Yeah. But that feedback has to be honest too. You know what I mean? Mm. So for, for that to really work. And again, I agree with everything that Ed was saying. And personally, I would I would rather bump people up close to 50%. It's just getting them, it's that mental hurdle for a lot of people that they can't make that jump. Mm -hmm. So it's it's knowing how to balance that. Because yeah, if it was up to me completely and there, there was no emotional attachment to that, to that scale weight number or to that calorie number, 
Uh, Because again, we tell people, hey, if we were to bump up your calories by 50%, they're automatically going to think, I'm just going to get fat again. Why should I do this? You know? So I think it's about finding that perfect balance for the right member as well, knowing, yeah, we know that getting the calories to come up is going to be the best thing for them. But sometimes the buy in for that can be a little bit shaky. It's come from the bodybuilding world, right? Where I think back in the day, it was increase your calories slowly and you try and stay as lean as possible. And then you just kept seeing all these like before and afters of people in shredded eating 1600 calories and then people eating 4,000 calories, only three pounds up. I've done that. I've done that picture as well. Right. And I thought I that was, that. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we thought that was the thing. And I think that probably carried over into sort of what we're doing with general population. But I think the biggest thing that's come in the last three to five years is realizing ourselves and but also across the board with more and more examples, whereas back then there wasn't as many examples of the difference between a checkpoint weight and a lifestyle weight and accepting yeah. the difference and knowing that the goal yeah. is not to the goal is not to to figure out how you stay shredded year round. The goal is to figure out how you feel, look and perform your best year round. And that, that, that there is going to be a gap and that you have to accept that gap. And I think that's been one of the biggest uh, shifts because I think in bodybuilding, what was being espoused back then, I don't know, I'm a bit plugged out in circles now, but back then it was very much how lean can you stay whilst eating as much food as possible? Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot, lot better. It's, it's a lot, lot better, better these days. days. Even in the bodybuilding world, everyone, everyone now, yeah. most, most people, most competitors, competitors serious competitors, will get out of a diet ASAP after, after their show. I think though, it's it's better, from what I see, it's better in the bodybuilding world. But what may be now coming, you know, ten years later or five years later, is what's the gen pop bodybuilding content that's out there because you know I, I'm quite strict with my social media feeds, so I try not to let any <laughs> anything like this come onto mine. But the impression I get is there is a lot of content that's a bit more mainstream, which is you know not bodybuilders, but you know your your non-competitive bodybuilders, your social media bodybuilders who have abs year round, yeah, 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 influencers yeah. who have abs year round, but are doing ten thousand calorie food challenges yeah, yeah. or there's a there is definitely like a prestige i guess a a bragging rights of hey look i got bay into my abs and i eat i eat ice cream before bed every night or i'm on seven thousand calories it's, it's you know, it's, right? it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so i think that is that is definitely being pushed out and you know when we are seeing people who yeah. are online who are either year-round posting photos from a shoot they did you do a shoot in January, you get enough photos and enough different outfits to post them all year round, or you're on drugs, or potentially you're on you're on drugs and you've got some some eating disorder stuff, like health, you know, under the surface isn't looking great, or you're just you know pretty good at dressing and finding good camera angles and whatever it is to to, to make yourself look like you're lean. But if you look on a lot of people's feeds. They are looking lean year round, and so I think that is I'm sure in, in a lot of people's heads is what the the norm, the norm is or yeah. that's what the goal is and that's the expectation um and i guess well, when i say lean, lean i'm talking about an unsustainable lean from like yeah. a health perspective rather than just not being fat well, i think the big thing is there's also <clears> rampant <throat> drug use drug use in in the fitness industry and just in the world mm-hmm. is going higher and higher and higher and higher and i think the people that you're referring to most of them are let's face it they're all on gear um and they're using a lot of drugs to help keep their body fat down and that percept- does warp the perception of what stay in shape yeah, around really, really, really uh, means. Yeah, yeah, and it's usually, it's I'd say it's usually around 10% away from your your lowest, probably. Um, but that's 10% if it's, if you got shredded. True. Can you, probably a bit less yeah. if, if, if you didn't. Mm. That's, that's even quite conservative, I think. Because I think if you if you got really lean, I think it's probably closer to 15 for, for most people. I mean, like, say... Yeah, yeah, yeah if, if you got... Re- uh, for me, I just worked out in my head, mine's about 12, 13%. 13% yeah, yeah. I think if you get really, there is the strong caveat of how lean you hit your checkpoint, because if there are people who will hit their checkpoint, whereas they physically, they could maintain that without, they haven't experienced any negative effects off that. It's very sustainable place. It's just talking about how, how lean you want to push for sure. And that kind of actually linked to one of the the other points I was, I was thinking when I asked this question was around what I would deem appropriate lifestyle body fat levels for, for for members and just for everyone in general, really. I think three years ago, I I don't I wasn't trying to keep people in shoot condition or that checkpoint condition, but it was just hovering above. And it was, I don't know, really actually in terms of percentages, but a place where 
maybe for, for a guy there was still some some outline of abs or, or whatever it is and for some people that will be appropriate but what i've definitely um come to think more over the last three years is that the level the level of body fat that's required to have the lifestyle that most people want in the long term is going to be higher than ideally they would like mm. and unfortunately that's like it's a bit of a bit of a pill to swallow um initially but if you can get over it it could actually it's probably what really unlocks successful long-term like lifestyle solution side of things and so that by that i kind of mean that the picture that we all have in our head of how we'd like to look for the rest of our life for guys it's probably got abs maybe for, for some women it's even got abs but it's it's a fairly lean physique you may be able to maintain that depending on what you have in your head long term but the lifestyle that accompanies that is most often not what someone wants long term so for example yeah. do you do you want to have to track all of your meals all the time do you want to have to do some form of act, like higher intensity activity five days a week do you want to have to do 10k steps a day whatever it is in order to do this because what's often seen is oh, i want to keep abs long term i want to drop sessions to three times a week maybe one cardio it should be football with the boys drop steps to 8k and then i'll just have untracked family meals now you could probably do all of that and still well you could do all of that and still maintain a lean physique but every time you you loosen things up in terms of, of what you're putting in you have to accept that the physique coming out is probably just going to be slightly further away than the um the greek god that you've got in your head the, the problem, problem is, is like the the, the reality, reality of what it's going to be is actually pretty very average and it, it, it's nothing really to scream home about is it especially no. if you haven't got much muscle uh, mm-hmm. that's the yeah, other thing yeah, if, you yeah. got, if you haven't got much muscle you're you're in for a you're in for a shock oh. yeah but that's where it's just accepting or being very aware of your priorities and just accepting that trade-off and you know it's like oh i look slightly better two kilos lighter but actually, if I go two kilos heavier, I get to eat a bit more food every day. So I'm just more satiated. I can incorporate a couple of meals out a week without it really impacting my body weight in a way that I enjoy without it really impacting my body weight. Whereas if you might enjoy being two kilos or whatever kilos lighter when you look in the mirror, but if yeah. outside of that mirror, when you look for it, look at it for 10 seconds in the morning, whatever, the rest of the day, you hate your life because you're having to be so restrictive, you're hungry, you've got low energy, training in the gym's awful, whatever it is, then those extra couple of kilos might be a very well worth trade-off um, in order yeah. to have that actual balance. Because we talk about having the balance of feel, look, and perform. And it's basically just, you can't just focus on the look. It's You've got to make sure you're you're feeling good, your performance good. I know you talked about this, Akash, around different weights different body yeah. weights you've got different you know oh, this weight is perfect for looking really good for my performance through the floor this weight performance is good but how i feel or whatever and then you basically just got to find what your equilibrium is of, of, of how they are balanced and maybe over time they will shift maybe in your 20s you're like actually i'm, I'm happy to be a little bit more restricted in order to look a little better maybe then you get yourself a partner and you're like actually maybe i could start to pull down on looks a little bit because i've already bad or whatever it is but you know you start to just balance those things out slightly differently but as long as you've got the balance which gives you the best end product um or the best yeah. end like net net gain mm. um that is ultimately your lifestyle solution i think you've got to figure this out after you get into sh- after you hit your checkpoint not on the way down because oh, on the way yeah, down, yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the way down everything feels good like you you know a lot of people, I, i've made this mistake as well where on the way down i think oh maybe this is the sweet spot yeah, I'm feeling amazing. I'm looking amazing. I'm forming, you know, sky high productivity. But when I come back to that same weight on the way up, I did, I did, I did what I didn't realize is I have a lot of food focus at that point, and that's usually yeah. the the biggest the biggest restrictor of holding people back is a high level of food focus. So I just realized, all right, it's not. I've got to figure it out on the way up. Um, and this yeah. is where trial and error through a long investment phase is really critical to find out where where you do sit in that spectrum and what your lifestyle is you know, what, what the right lifestyle is for you to to live um and live a healthy yeah. life long term yeah I, I think the physique in during that phase should be a byproduct of your ideal lifestyle solution right it shouldn't be like this mm-hmm. thing that you have to focus on 100 yeah. every single day like everything that you do should be automatic by then you have yeah as ed was saying you have a couple meals out you, you're comfortable going out to social events you can regulate your appetite this and that you can you do all these things on autopilot and whatever physique ends up being, that is sort of your lifestyle solution physique. And I think all the tools that we teach our members throughout their time here at r and allows them to, yeah, potentially maintain a better physique while being able to put all these things on automatic. But it's not going to be your checkpoint physique. 
And yeah. I think learning how to accept that and understand it's it's a good thing to not actually hang there and to actually get a bit heavier and do all the other, you know, get all the other benefits from a lifestyle solution. That is so much better than, yeah, as Ed was saying, you look in the mirror, you're happy for 10 seconds of the day, but you're absolutely miserable the rest of the day. <laughs> it's also, because you're trying to put so much energy and focus into looking a certain way. Never it's works. It's, it's important to remember that what, what, what you guys are saying is not that you're, you're going to end up fat, fat in this period, period or you're going to end up back to your normal. normal. You're still, still going to, you're still going to, you're still going to look good in clothes. You're still going to um, be quote unquote slim, healthy, uh, relatively lean. It's just, you're not going to be checkpointing and you're not going to be where you were before, but it's by no means a bad place. This, this place you're describing. Cause remember most, most people can get all the benefits of, most people get all the benefits of being lean from, we'll get all the benefits of being lean from this, the productivity, the cognition, the energy, um, and, and really getting into shape is, is that, it's, it's almost, almost like, like putting the plaster off and doing something, something you didn't think was possible to then allow yourself to do this. I don't think you can do this bit without doing the first bit. So it's, it's important to remember you need to do both. To, you have to almost earn the right to, to do this bit and to actually do it properly. Yeah. And some people, you know, Ivan is probably the best example I've ever come across of like, who's got all of the benefits of the lifestyle he wants at a very lean physique. So it's it's not like for everyone, you have to gain a part of weight. It's more just w- what do you want your lifestyle to look like and then accepting yeah. accepting what that, how that impacts. If you want exactly. to carry on doing loads, a lot of cardio, a lot of steps, being quite regimented with your nutrition and you enjoy that, you feel good, it gives you that look, form, look, feel and perform balance that's great. There's no need to put on body fat just for the sake of it, as long as that health's in a good place and everything. But if you are someone who's like looking into the long term and thinking, especially around nutrition, but around, I want to really move away from tracking. I, I'm someone who enjoys eating out a lot. That is all absolutely fine. But you've just got to accept as, as you move towards that, it's probably going to mean that that settling point for you is going to just be slightly high body fat, not overweight, which, but it's just going to be. Which is completely fine. You know, exactly. Yeah, which slightly is more than what you originally thought. I think it's really good for so many people. That's the thing. Like, I think many people they they get into yeah they get into they get they get to check they get to checkpoint condition, and they think a couple of kilos above that is now fat again. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, do you know where you have come from? Like, do you, do you know what I mean? Like, and again, sometimes that can be a little bit of a distorted thing, right? When people don't have the right mindset going into a uh, transformation, but you need to sometimes understand that just because you you again you, you shouldn't compare yourself to your leanness. You know what I mean? I think that's a really, really rocky road and it's a really bad place to be because as we've been saying, your leanest isn't going to be your most productive, your your happiest or like how you feel in general. Akash, but the last time you got into, how long did it take you to recover from your um, last uh, trip? That was a scary place to be. I'd say six months months, like in in all in all. Like it took me mentally to get out of that. There you go. Massive, right? That's huge. That's what about imagine you're like, well, I want, I want, yeah, what if you're like, no, you got to stay there because of Instagram? <laughs> you know, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you'd die in a couple of years, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the crazy thing is, I remember I was thinking about competing later in the year. So I was going to, no, I was going to do the shoot in April and I'll compete in October. It only, it, it took me till October to get back to like normally, normal in my head. And even though my body was back to normal, just mentally over the whole process, I'd say, yeah, looking back, it took me that long. I can't imagine where I'd be right now if I'd held condition for six months. Like I'd probably be castrated, right? I don't think my... Well, you'd probably be, yeah, um, you'd probably no be an, an online coach talking about how dieting is really bad for you and you just have to uh, <laughs> yeah. love yourself and, and eat donuts is fine. <laughs> well, that kind of segues nicely. Well, I don't know if it does, but it might segue nicely <laughs> into <laughs> possible sporting element of... Uh, of the investment phase and yeah how we've shifted thoughts on on our on muscle building because i think a couple of years ago i think we all pushed very much get in shape and then build muscle now i think it's very rare we we speak to people about actually an aggressive muscle building or a proper muscle building phase that you know we what we classify as a quote-unquote bulk uh where you do drastically improve your physique and what it takes to to go into that so maybe we explore that next yeah i think I think just to preface before we say this is that if you want to build, <clears throat> or if you want to change your physique long term, adding muscle to it is going to be the most effective way to do that. You can lose body fat and that will give you a, a change over however many months you do that. 
but if you want to keep changing it and make really, really big changes, it's going to come from, from building muscle. And if you want to build a significant amount of muscle, you're going to need to go through a, a focused muscle building phase. It's going to be the best way to do it. That's definitely the most optimal way. That's going to involve being in a calorie surplus for a prolonged period of time, accompanied with progressive training. And that will come, that will help you build muscle, but it'll also bring about some, some body fat increase along the way as well. That's where we talked about this loads of times about embracing the fluff and pushing aggressively. So if you want to build as much muscle as possible, that's definitely the most optimal way to go. I think looking in, applying it actually into the, the real world and the people we're working with, that's the part that probably we've changed our minds on more over the last few years, is that how often is that really appropriate? And how much of the, the gains do you get from that versus the trade-offs that you get? So when we look at, what potentially you know you're gaining is is the best rate of muscle growth you can potentially get. But a big caveat there is you're only really going to get that if you accompany it with, as I said, that progressive training. And for a lot of gen pop people who aren't you know seriously into their their training or aren't serious bodybuilders, providing that stimulus for muscle growth is often a bottleneck for for muscle gain. And so you can literally feed people as much as they want if you're not training hard enough or with good enough form the muscle's not going to grow. You've got to provide that stimulus and then the food's just there to then actually turn that stimulus into something. So if people aren't aren't taking training like really seriously, which you know is it's just up to you and how much you enjoy it and how much you want to take it seriously. But if you're not sending regular training videos to a coach so they can actually help, because I can promise you as much as you think your training is amazing, you've had a gym membership for 10 years, training is not as good as you think it is. Um so if you're you know if you're not in that boat, or if you are in that boat of of not doing that kind of stuff regularly, and even if you have been to the point where training is now in a really good place, effort levels and form are both are both you know solid, then aggressive muscle building just, just isn't even worth consideration. It's just controlled fat gain, really. Um, but even if you you have those boxes ticked off, you've then got to look at the the impact on on other areas. So pushing body weight up with you know majority of it coming from body fat is going to change how you look. In most people's opinion, you know, during that time, probably not for the better. So are you willing to to have a physique for one to two years, which, you know, as natural people is probably the time we need to be spending in muscle building phases to make significant progress? Are you willing to have higher levels of body fat for a prolonged period of time? Especially when we look at the people, most people we're working with have come from being overweight. I mean, had most of your life overweight, wanting to be leaner. You now finally got leaner. Do you want to go back to not not back to that same place by any means, but to the point where you've got a little bit more body fat than you would ideally like. Often not. Another point is also just the health aspect. We're not going to push people to the point that they become obese or, you know, it's a really significant health issues, but there is, it's within like a, a bit of a spectrum and the higher your body weight goes as a general rule, <clears throat> your, your health is probably going to take a little bit of a knock. And especially if that most of that weight gain is coming from body fat gain, your health markers are probably going to start to move in a slightly negative direction. But I said, if you're doing it under our guidance, we're going to have our own kind of, I guess, guidelines in our head. We're like, okay, this is probably acceptable because health isn't just one thing. It's kind of like a everyone's got their own range of what they think healthy is. But you're still moving towards that, that negative side. A lot of the people we're working with, 30s, 40s, 50s, maybe beyond that, as you start to get older, the negative side of going slightly further towards that negative side of the, the health continuum is probably going to be you know a bit more extreme. Again, if you spend most of your life overweight, not exercising, not eating well, probably already coming from a, a bad health, bad place from a health perspective. You've made some progress going towards it. Do you want to start moving back there? Maybe there's already some underlying stuff that's that's happened from how you've led up to this point, which makes it a little bit more risky going back, you know, shifting things back towards that place. Is that really worth it? Um, I think that where I kind of land most times, 99% of the time is no, it's probably not. Um, and the approach I think is a lot, a lot more, more applicable for, for most people we work with is continuing to train hard, to continuing to, to improve your training. So both in terms of form and effort that will allow your training to progress over time. Most of the people we work with are so untrained when they come to us that they don't need to be in these big surpluses to build muscle. The fact that their muscles, like these are still, it's still so novel, just the fact that their muscles are working, they can just keep being progressive while at maintenance. They'll still be able to, to build muscle without issue. It may mean that muscle gain over the long term is slightly slower or you don't 
by the end of your life, you haven't built quite as much muscle. But the trade-off is that your health stays in a really good place. You can maintain a leaner physique year round, so you're looking and feeling better, um, as well as continuing to, to push that needle in terms of training as well. No, I think, Ed, you're, you're bang on there, dude. I think there's so much validity in everything you said, and especially from the health perspective. Like, I just don't see, like, especially as you're getting over 35, over 40, there's definitely no need for you to be doing these aggressive bulks. Like, I just think for a lot of a lot of people, the risk is not worth the risk isn't worth the reward. To be fair, you know what I mean. And yeah. most people would just be far better staying closer to maintenance, training hard, pushing hard, and letting their body fat be at yeah at a comfortable level. You know what I mean. It doesn't have to go crazy higher for you to see a, a good amount of of muscle muscle mass increase. You know what I mean. Um, and again, like even if you were to go as hard as possible to build as much as you could, like even if you were to go all in, like how much more muscle would you build over say a two year period in comparison to someone who just took it like a little bit slower? Yeah. You, you may, you may put on a little bit more, but you're also putting on a ton of extra body fat that you eventually have to come off that eventually has to come off. And we also know that what if you overshoot at this time around, you put on more body fat than you, you know, more body fat than you wanted and you accumulate more of those fat cells, which we know that you cannot actually get rid of fat cells. You can only shrink them. So now you're potentially setting yourself up for future problems again, because now you've added even more body fat, right? Mm. So I think, yeah, there's just so many things that are just not worth it. And you can still get all the benefits from resistance training by not pushing your body weight up so aggressively. You know, you can still get the muscular gains. Most people would love to stay relatively leaner most all year round, live a, ha live a good life, be happy, you know, all that stuff you can do without having to aggressively try to gain muscle, you know, focus on getting stronger, eat around maintenance, live live a happy life. And I think yeah. you'll be a lot better off, you know. It's hard, hard work because there's a lot of eating to do. And I think that the, 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 yeah, there is a lot of eating and, and the training is, um, which by the way, sounds, in, sounds exciting, but believe me, when you eat that much clean food, clean, quote unquote, clean food, it's not going to be, uh, not going to be the most fun thing to do. But I think the training thing is the biggest one. Just It's just, you yeah. just got to train so hard, so consistently over so long to do it. And it's hard work. It's like, it's not a 16 week fat loss period. The reality is to build the physique that you have in your head. It's going to be three to four cycles of 18 to 24 months, probably. And that's a long time to get the physique you want. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think what, the, the, sorry, just the point that I even said around the, if it goes on, it has to come off in terms of body fat is, is really one that just to emphasize as well, because unless you want to get to that top end of fluffiness and then just maintain there, which I don't think anyone does, You've just done this big diet to get all the initial fat off. I'm not saying you can never diet again, but do you do you want to make it a bigger diet again? You know, I think a great if you do have ideas of potentially wanting to to hit checkpoint again or like you know go to go to another shoot. I like the thought of not wanting to. Uh, Alberto Nunes is the one who kind of said this, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Is it's not starting a diet more than ten percent away from from the end point. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're going to do another shoot. Do you want to be, do you want to start 20%, 30% over that? I mean, 30% would be pretty out of control, but let's even say like 20% over that. If you drop a 1% per, per week, let's just say that's a 20 week diet, you know, that's the guts of six months at the end of it, just to get back to, to that shoot. Like it's, that's then a, a big commitment in terms of fat loss again. Um, and that's where you've got to take into account how easy was that first diet? If you didn't really enjoy fat loss that much, or there was a lot of, of stomach and stuff, or it took a lot longer than potentially it could have done, you know, bodybuilders go between these these big bulking cycles and then go into these cuts, but their life is built around it. And then going into fat loss is very efficient. They get in, they get it done, they get back out again. If you're someone who wants to go for a fat loss phase, but also has a family holiday, goes on a work trip every other week, these fat loss phases start to become longer. And then for every period you spend building muscle, you have quite a long period of taking the fat off afterwards mm. just to take into account as well. I mean, I, 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 I've, I've done, done the 90 kilos, kilos to 70, 70 kilos, kilos in 21 weeks, and I would not <laughs> want to do that again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was 30% above checkpoint. I was 30% above. I mean, I was a trainer on the gym floor at the time, and people, and other trainers, clients were asking their trainer, is Dakar still training? I was training like the hardest I've ever trained, eat really being strict to my food. That's, That's the reality, reality of a bulk. I mean, it looked great afterwards, but it was a shit ton of work to get that body fat off. Yeah. Um, so, so you don't go thirty percent above your checkpoint. checkpoint. <laughs> yeah. um, and and shifting gears, gears into like lifestyle solution. I think one thing we're all sort of moving into is concurrent training. 
I think, I think it's, it's often, often like a, a thing that you hear. hear. We, we, we we've probably heard this is you know when you hear of like trainers or people in the fitness industry are like over forty, and they all say like oh after like 10, 15 years, you end up sort of changing your training style, adding new things. I think we're all in that phase now, right? And one, one thing I've changed my mind a lot on is the use of running, the current training, training how they, they can all be, be meshed together. But I think Ivan was probably the first to sort of venture into that, that, that field. We, we've sort of string the, yeah. strung bodybuilding a lot longer than potentially we should have. <laughs> um, but I think concurrent <laughs> training is an interesting topic that may be the better option for uh, the general population who, who want to just stay in shape and don't want to go on these aggressive bolts. Can you, can you define uh, that as well, Ivan? Concurrent training. Uh, yeah, so it's simply just using the most common form would be combining some sort of resistance training with some cardiovascular training along with that. So you're doing both things concurrently, you know, and the um, the sort of old wisdom or, yeah, people are still propagating the whole thing of like, you know, if you're, if you're training to build muscle mass, then you simply shouldn't do any cardio because cardio by nature breaks down. Um, stores in the body while what you're trying to do is is grow so why would you want to be doing something that diminishes your ability to grow muscle and i think it was a very very simplistic view of the entire thing and a lot of a lot of the ideas were propagated from this one research paper that happened in the 80s where the the, the researcher got um, two groups one group just did resistance training for like i think there was five sessions a week or something just weight training and then the other group did five weight training sessions plus six high intensity endurance one hour sessions a week as well. And then by the end of seven weeks, because up until seven weeks, they were actually getting the same level of strength, right? But then after seven weeks, there was this huge drop off in the people that were doing the endurance training. And then they they were like, yep, see, yeah. concurrent training, can't do it. It's just like, well, <laughs> exactly. And now what, what's becoming more and more known now is just that it wasn't really this concurrent thing that was going on. It was more just, you only have a finite capacity to recover, right? So it has, it's more to do with your ability to recover and adapt to your training versus just saying cardio diminishes your ability to, to gain muscle. So if you can find a way to, to program both of these variables effectively and not exceed your own recovery capacity, the, the two can work beautifully in tandem, you know, in my opinion. And I think most people can seriously get the best out of, out of both worlds, especially in the lifestyle solution. Now, again, something is always going to have to take up priority. So if resistance training is your priority or muscle building is a priority, that doesn't mean you should just neglect cardiovascular work altogether. And, you know, I'm sure you guys would agree that your the CV work that you guys have been um, doing has potentially made your resistance training more productive from like a ability to push harder, ability to go deeper in certain, in certain aspects. But I think there was this huge push of, yeah, no cardio, no nothing for a long time. But I think that is starting to reverse itself now. And yeah, even the high-end bodybuilders now are now throwing interval training in and this and that, um, whatever. But I think for, for people who um, are looking to, yeah, as, as part of their lifestyle solution, a concurrent training model, I think, would be fantastic for so many people because there are so many health benefits and mental benefits you get from cardiovascular training. And yeah, you, you get the same from resistance training too, but having having a blend of both, I think, is just the ideal for most people to cover all aspects of your health, right? I, think I, I used to only use cardio, cardio during... Um, during oh, to burn calories. Yeah, it's a yeah, 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 just part of that. that. I would never, I'd then I'll do it for a bit during consolidation, and then, then it kind of whittle off to you know one an interval session every six weeks or something. Um, but it's probably the last yeah. like maybe nine months. It's probably been the first time I've had it consistently in my routine, and I really, really enjoy it. And I think it's probably yeah. it's probably something maybe the low intensity stuff, but the accessibility to go hard is also there. If you think about like doing, pushing yourself on a hack squat is a lot harder, I'd say, than just going for a long run. If yeah. that makes sense, like the, the ability or a long cycle ride. Um, so I think accessibility is a lot easier so long as you're injury free um, and you're not oh, too yeah, overweight. I see what you mean. Yeah. 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 From um, a time perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's that's one thing I've just massively changed my mind on is that the, the importance of it and just valuing it outside of just weight loss and fat loss periods. Because I used to just think cardio, all right, just use it to burn the calories off, be able to eat more food. Um, but now yeah. it's, it's very much health, fitness, and just sort of an overall holistic approach. 
but also you, you've found a way that links to something that you truly value. So I think that's the kicker. You value your Muay Thai now, right? So you want to get really, really good at fighting and you know, okay, well, to, for me to be a good fighter, I need to be very aerobically fit, you know? So now the the reason the reason for you wanting to, to do cardio is far more powerful instead of just, oh, I'm only doing cardio to burn calories or I'm only doing cardio because I overate. You see how that is not a good relationship with activity in general. And, uh, uh, you know, hopefully for people that are listening, this is the way that you should. I don't, I don't never like to say you should be doing something, but this is the ideal way to be looking at exercise and nutrition over the long term, right? It's not something that you feel that you have to do. It's stuff that you want to do, right? So if you can find a way to make cardiovascular work enjoyable or that fits into something that you truly value, then you're going to find adherence to these things so much easier, you know? And that would be, that's probably, that's probably for a different, different discussion altogether. But, you know, yeah, if we, we talk, talk about concurrent training, go back to concurrent training. training uh, I, I do think, think there are definitely good ways to, to combine the two and to, and, you know, there are certain things. Yeah, we, we talk, talk about this more in the, in the curriculum for, for the year two, for our year two members on, you know, yeah, what, what modalities are best to optimize certain variables, this and that. But the crux of it is people should be doing, in my opinion, as much cardio and as much activity that they can realistically do and recover from. Because, because I, think I think the health benefits, benefits are going to be brilliant. You know what I mean? So the, the more you can do and recover from and not burn out from, the better. But that that, that line is very, very hard to, to find, as we know. <laughs> and anything for you to add on that? Um, I think for me, it's not something I've really changed my mind on. I think for me, it's probably I've got a lot better at implementing it. I think I'd... Mm. Um, Initially, because I was I was doing a master's and I was learning a lot of this kind of, yeah, and we were talking about concurrent training and the interference effect. Mm. But I was also at the same time doing a, an internship with this rugby team and they were getting absolutely beasted during pre-season. And they would do weights first thing and they would, you know, lift yep. some pretty crazy weights. And then a couple of hours later, they'd go out and they'd do conditioning stuff. And they were all doing, you know, impressive things from a conditioning standpoint. I remember just thinking... You know, years ago now, when I was at you, but just thinking, well, I'm reading here in the textbook, just isn't applying here because these guys are these guys are squatting 200 kilos, right. but they're also hitting whatever on the yo-yo tests. Like they don't seem to have any problem progressing. And so, as much as I think you can look at it, one, there's the flaw of like say the studies from before, but also I think when you look at stuff like interference, which potentially sciencey way of saying how one can have a knock-on effect on the negative Im- impact the other, but the reality is. If you want to specialize in anything really, really high level, the yeah. other the more the other stuff matters and it's gonna have a negative effect. But unless you're really pushing to that top one, two percent, the less that stuff then matters. Mm-hmm. So the area that most of us are living in, there's room to do both. Like yeah. yeah, if you really want to be the if I want to be the strongest person in the world, maybe I need to sack off these long runs. But the reality is how strong I actually am and how close I am to elite level in running, I can I've already held double body weight for multiple reps in the same week as running 20 miles. I've done it the day after. I've run 20 miles the day after doing that. Right, like, you flex and it's been fine. <laughs> yeah, but but it's like that's that's <laughs> well within, you know, if I was RDL in 400 kilos, then yeah, maybe the long runs aren't the thing. But it's like it's so much more of a – we're so far away. Most of us, most people who listen to this are probably so far away from actually where – where that interference effect is really, really going to come into play, as long as you do things sensibly. And the sensible yeah. part is probably where it's clicked in my head the last few years in terms of I was probably doing what those studies did orig- originally. I was weight training and I was <laughs> like, all right, I'll step up the cardio. So I'll just add those sessions on top. Or I yeah, would say, oh, r- running always hurts my knees, but I'd go in from nothing to trying to PB a 10K on day one. Whereas like actually implementing yeah. it in a better way has probably been where the light bulb was kind of switched in my yeah. head over the last few years in terms of like finding a way to actually do it both progressively without just three weeks in burning out. So so I remember, remember when I first started, started my time, I, was I was trying to keep up doing the full weight training sessions, sessions and I was trying to add in the cardio and, and I was trying to do the white side. And I realized I could, I'm going to be trained twice a week to get, get the, to get everything else done and still recover. Yeah. The first three months I was getting, I was getting a cold every four weeks. And not because of sort of, illness but because of just being run down um so trying to find that balance has been it's been difficult but it's been interesting to see what the body can actually take and, and do once you give it a bit more time to adapt yeah and fuel it fuel it appropriately as well mm-hmm. i think there are a lot of people who don't know how to fuel their cardiovascular training it's it's far more calorie expending than weight training far more 
you know, and people definitely have a tendency, especially if you come from like the bodybuilding physique world, people tend to underfuel for a long period of time. You know, they don't understand the importance of it. And it was only recently until I started actually fueling myself on my longer rides. Now, I didn't realize just how much of a difference it can make during the ride, you know? So again, that's we're always learning, we're always adapting. But yeah, that's another thing that if you're going to do if you're going to do concurrent training as well, then you do require more food coming in for you to recover from all that and adapt, you know? So, and, but again, it was, it's, that's not me saying, oh, do see, do cardiovascular work so you can eat more. It's no, no, no. You know, you, you do, you eat more because you're doing the CV work, if that makes sense. So it's this complete reframe, right? You're not using nutrition as a way to just, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to do cardio so I can just eat more. It's like, no, 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 that's not the approach that you want to be taking. But when you have this performance mindset, you start to look at all these things very, very differently. And you realize, damn, if I'm going to be doing that much activity, I need to be fueling enough. Otherwise, I'm going to burn out very, very quickly, especially if you've got big goals when it comes to your endurance trust stuff as well. Now, I know Ed was saying, you know, we're all far, quite far away from our genetic ceilings on these things. But if you do want to see long-term progression, then yeah, you're going to have to get your food dialed in properly. And that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I think getting getting the food and stuff and, and getting an appropriate plan in place that's all balanced is, I think, appropriate for everyone. I think the point I was yeah. more saying was just that you're probably not going to run into these big um, negative impacts that are often hyped up if your plan makes sense for a long time. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason you say a bolt is running marathons at the same time as doing a 100-meter sprint. But we could probably do the same and, and be okay. Yeah, very true. Uh, any final sense well, especially, of sorry, just for you, because your your running pace is your long distance running pace is good, but it's also your hundred meter pace, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's literally the same. <laughs> yeah, I'll be I was thinking about this morning when I was going for a walk, I was like, I need to crack this uh this this speed thing going on. Like, <laughs> like but, yeah, embarrassing when I saw that. I came out. I came out that eight hundred meter into a run. And I thought, yeah, that was real good. That was some real good, real good splits there. I looked at it. I was like, "That's the same as my five k splits." Any closing sentiments with um, what what you changed your mind on? Um, one, Ivan, you I, I, I've written here that you wanted to say was around uh, taking time to truly transform. So maybe that's a good finished oh, yeah, sentiment. Yeah. But before we do, is there any others that you want to bring into the mix that would be uh, applicable? For me, the biggest thing was actually there's. Some of these things, obviously, we've taken an hour or whatever talking about them, so it's quite a bit, but the underlying foundations haven't really changed. You know, like, ultimately, energy balance still applies. Ultimately, like, adherence is going to be the main thing for, for actually success. Engaging in the process is, is going to be the way for us to help you then adhere. Like, all of the fundamental things, and that's probably why, if you scroll back three, five years, we're still producing really, really good results. So it's not like it's suddenly figured out the basics of it but i think it's just this fine tuning over the last three years of maybe some of the smaller things that have that have helped so i, th I, I think, think why they've, they've come out is because now we've got, got longer term journeys got, got more evidence of people we work, work with, with for longer, longer periods of time so you can see the ramp not like, like the ramifications but the effects of things that may have been applied in the first year and how that applies to the second year the third year the fourth year yeah yeah the foundations haven't changed but our implementation and understanding of it have changed i think allowing us to get better results. Yeah, so just to introduce the final sentiment around it taking a mm. long time to transform in that you can uh, shed the physical weight in 1% a week, you can shed that physical weight, but to shed yeah. the mental, emotional, and all the weight that causes you to gain the weight in the first place, it's going to take yeah. a lot much longer. Much longer. Much longer. Much longer. Yeah. yeah, so, so I, think I think it definitely, definitely changed, changed my mind on that. that. I, I thought, thought, cool, we, we lose, lose the weight, weight we consolidate, consolidate and... and Perfect. Perfect, you're, you're done. done. There you go. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but what, what we're, we're seeing, seeing more of is just that these underlying behaviors, these underlying um, habits, or the way you, you deal with social scenarios, or the way you deal with um, emotions, isn't that? I think all that still takes a lot of time to change because during a checkpoint, um, you have the shiny object to focus on. So most people can like avoid the hard stuff that we're talking about there until they hit checkpoint. They can hack their way there. You know, because cool, we've got this endpoint. I've got this massive accountability. I don't want to step in front of a camera looking like garbage. So I'm going to do everything I possibly can. But what happens is they do that, they get in shape, but because they haven't changed the underlying wirings in their brain about certain things, they haven't really transformed yet. 
And this is where we talk about, you know, the whole, it take you six, 12 months to lose the physical weight, but it can take you 12, eight, you know, 12, 18, 24, 36 months to truly solidify your new identity, you know, um, and re and put these new foundations in your brain down of who the person that you actually want to be and the person who you actually are. You know, I think that stuff takes a very, very long time. Um, and this is even coming up in the research now, right? With um, the the long term success of weight loss maintainers, and you know, there's the that stat of you know people who are successful at maintaining it for a year after their diet have a fifty percent chance of keeping it off the following year, and those odds increase the longer they keep it off. And a lot of that does come down to reforming an identity, you know, being this new person. Because if you've if you've been the person for thirty years who would um after a hard day's work or something bad happens, you were to come home and eat your feelings away. Well, you may have hacked that during your process phase for a little bit. You may have put that, it's, it's maybe put on the side, it's, it's dormant, but that can still come, come alive post-checkpoint. And it usually does because you haven't dealt with that stuff. So I think all that stuff takes much, much longer to really work through and deal with in comparison to just losing the physical weight. So yeah, I've definitely changed my mind on that. And yeah, I just think it takes a lot longer than most people thought. Amazing. With that, let's uh, let's end it here. Five years time, we'll record it again and realize everything we're saying today was- <laughs> 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 